Excellent, everyone. Okay, we're at 11.06. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have a QA section if you feel like putting in a specific question. <laughs> All good, Molly. We love knowing your site, Molly. That's great. <laughs> Becky. Spring bar, love it. Hey, Erin, all you got to do is ask, right? I know, this is great. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started today with how to remove friction across omni-channel shopping. And omni-channel, I'm sure, looks a lot different for everyone and what their focus is. So if you're in here as a brand, feel free to throw in your unique cases that we can address. We do have our agenda and what we want to go through, but happy to pivot to the real-time questions you guys have regarding anything we say. Awesome, so we'll get into our speakers today. You have myself coming from the Just You Know perspective. And my experience here at Just You Know has been one, working with brands one-on-one -on -one and literally executing their strategies on site that they want to implement for increased conversions through pop-ups. And then two, working with brands to make the most out of their tech stack. So whatever tools you're using, however you're using them, I'm working with brands to see where does just, you know, supplement that or even fit in to what you're using. Would love to take it over to Sherry for an intro. Thank you, SJ. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name's Sherry Selva. I'm the VP of Lifecycle Marketing here at Levitate Foundry. We are, and I'm, I love saying this, we are proudly minority, female founded and led since 2019. Woo! And our team is 80% female. I just throw that in there. It's, I love that. It, I just love it. It's like, that's it was, the most important part. You have, I know, yeah. <laughs> Michael's like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I support this. We are a full service agency. We can handle all of your digital marketing needs. Um, I encourage you to take a look at our site later on to check out some of our amazing case studies. But uh, my main focus is life cycle marketing. I have been doing this since God was a boy, and I've seen the evolution take place from, oh my God, email's dead to email's not dead. And I enjoy every moment of it. I love the loyalty aspect and retention aspect of it. Um, I won't go on and ramble. I will go ahead and shut up so everybody can. <laughs> You're good, Cher. You got a lot of love in the chat. That's awesome. Erin, can we get an intro from you, please? Hello, everybody. So once again, I am Erin Watt. I am one of the tech partner managers over here at Triple Whale. And I was very, very lucky. So prior to Triple Whale, I got to work very closely with the Gorgeous team. So I was actually one of Gorgeous tech partner managers prior to Triple Whale. So it's very, very exciting to be sharing the stage with my good friend Michael here as well, too. And for those who are unfamiliar with Triple Whale, so Triple Whale is a state-of-the-art e-commerce analytics platform that is crafted to revolutionize how online businesses manage and optimize their data. So basically, we really simplify the path to profitable growth by helping you understand who your customers are, where they came from, what they bought, and of course, how much it costs to acquire them. And today, we proudly are the source of truth for 11,000 plus Shopify, Shopify plus stores. So really excited to be here with all of you today. Yes, you guys expose everything that's happening. Everything. You, everything. Everything. If you good, want to know. The bad. <laughs> yeah, you'll see it there. Thank you, Aaron. And Michael, can we get an intro, please? Hello, everybody. My name is Michael. I'm a tech partner manager here at Gorgeous. If you're not familiar with Gorgeous, we're a you know unified customer experience platform. We help uh, brands grow through AI-powered customer experience. We help consolidate all those channels. You know, phone, SMS, email, uh, anywhere where your customers are reaching out, all into one place. And we help you automate common responses and generate revenue out of a support channel. Uh, we integrate with hundreds of other uh, companies, including Triple Whale. And uh, yeah, really excited to be here today um, and chat Shopify uh, strategies. Uh, we work with like over 15,000 brands on Shopify and Shopify Plus as well. So I think we're going to have some really good uh, overlaps here with our discussion. Absolutely. And I feel like I have to say, Michael, although we don't have an integration, we as tools, just, you know, and gorgeous pull a lot of the same information from your e-commerce platform and what you're doing for just like similar segmenting opportunities, targeting. So calling that out, but we all work really great together. And yeah, feel free to throw your questions in as we're getting started. Thank you for the intros. 
So I've got an agenda and I'll backtrack for a sec. Can everyone hear me okay? I saw a comment that it was really quiet. This cool, yeah, okay. Loud and clear, excellent, thank you. So agenda that we'll get into, we're gonna start with awareness. We'll get into pricing and retention and then follow that up with trust building, all in the scope of thinking about omni-channel. And this is really an agenda built on the feedback that we got during registration time when you all signed up. So I'm excited to see and hopefully address what those concerns were when it comes to objections and friction in omni-channel. I've got some examples to show throughout if I can get to them. Otherwise, you guys will get this deck and you'll be able to see everything. Cool. So we'll get started with our first theme, all about awareness. So our first theme is around this question of how would you leverage an upcoming brand launch, product launch, or collaboration to enhance your brand's awareness across channels? This is kind of a big one, right? To me, this is like the like why you should choose us and what that message is in each of your channels. And when I'm thinking of awareness, it's maybe not a spot where there is a lot of friction. You know, it's more of just like trying to guide someone in the right direction. So when I'm thinking about leveraging maybe an upcoming brand launch or a collaboration, I'll stick on collaboration. And when I'm leveraging that, it's tapping into that other audience outside of like my immediate audience. So like a collaboration with an influencer, a, a creator of any sort, even another brand that's in your industry, right? But they're not doing exactly what you're doing. So finding that that common story between you two and leverage that story in your creative on-site messaging, which I'll show some examples later. But that's where I would really leverage is like think outside of your audience and then just tap into what that other audience could mean to you. I would love to take this to Michael. What's Gordon's thoughts on this and yours, of course. Yeah, I think that uh, what you mentioned on like guiding people to the right place is, is really interesting. Um, with awareness, I think you also want to consider like folks who are coming live to your website. Um, you know, how are you actively engaging those people? Do you have a way to do it? Um, kind of specific more to the like the new product launch. Let's say you have a new capsule or you know a new item or something complimentary that you're trying to promote and and build some awareness around. Like, are you letting them know that this is new and exciting like are you serving um relevant pre-sales content like an example would be a shopper comes to the first time for your website um and maybe they're on your site for a certain amount of time or maybe they click a certain page right you could then use those actions to then trigger an event to like serve them a video that's like educational about what that product is through a live chat um and then guide them through a buying experience from there so you're capturing their interest while they're live on your site, serving them relevant content, building that awareness of what that product is, and then being able to like, you know, it's, you know, sometimes people have to see things more than once, but that might just be the first time that they're seeing it. Um, then maybe you have something that collects for, um, you know, 10% off to capture their email. And then you start dripping that out. And now you're like truly building that, that process. Um, and also like, are you equipped right now to recommend products to like boost average order value right um it's all about identifying like that customer journey that you want people to have and implementing like touches along the way that speak to that journey gorgeous is helping brands do that a bit today with uh something called gorgeous convert which is like personalized chat campaigns that are powered by shopify data so you'll already know like have they bought something from you before maybe they haven't and you can kind of segment using that Awesome. So a lot of signals you're taking from that. I noted, like you mentioned video, and that's a good call out for like this awareness, any awareness campaign, like video can be very specific to different social channels like TikTok, Instagram, and the length that they are too. But those videos, that kind of content translates really nicely to on-site when it's presented to the right person. And I liked your call out to like, do they know it's new? Like you don't really know what all they've seen beforehand and you, it may feel really repetitive to you or it may feel like you're showing maybe the same message twice or more than one time. But if you're including segmentation in some way in there, then you're doing you're doing it the right way, I would say. 
Thanks, Michael. Great comments there. Let's take it to Sherry. What are you thinking from the agency side? Over here in agency land, I would say this is the number one reason we get hired, right? Because yeah. from soup to nuts, this is this is our sweet spot, right? From the site, paid ads, organic, lifecycle, affiliate, we can kind of come in and put all these things together, right? So that's a huge win when you look at agency for something like a brand launch, because we can help with that unification. We have all these big brains that are experts in their you know individual channels that can come in and help make sure that not only is the launch successful, but what's the data coming in? What are, are you know, we're, we kind of know what to look for in the yellow flag, red flag situation um, across the board when it's like, oh, is there issues with the links? Is there something going on? Um, is the site speed slowing down? I mean, you know, I don't know all the site stuff. I, I'll just focus on my life cycle as Oh, I think you muted yourself. Lost your audio. I hit the ding computer. And <laughs> you got too excited. <laughs> off my hands too much. So I'm a victim of speaking with my hands. Um, but for lifecycle and SMS, obviously we're top, top, middle, and bottom. But our sweet spot is really middle to bottom of funnel. Mm -hmm. So we can catch all these amazing leads, but then we can nurture them about the brand, right? Did they get? Did they convert through the welcome series? If not, how do we get them to convert? Did they click on anything in particular, right? Yeah. We can take all these data points that come in through emails, whether they're coming in organically, whether they're coming in from paid, whether they're coming in from social, and we can use that data to help nurture and get that awareness out there. Did they make a purchase? Great. What did they purchase? Okay, let's put them over here in this bucket. Did they not? Okay, let's put them in this bucket. Did they use a discount code? You know, there's so many attributions that we can pull from and then get those specific strategies going that can continue to nurture. Um, we can then start taking it up to the next level. If you are a new brand, you know, maybe you need subscriptions or maybe you want a loyalty program. You know, there's all sorts of different data that, that we can look at, right? And that's why I love using platforms like Triple Whale and Gorgeous because I can get a lot of more of that. Um, to use that to create these strategies. So we're speaking to these folks at the right time with the right messages and the right content. Because I think that's the key for us, right? Um, the ability for, for email and SMS to have that kind of window in, you know, we know when you shopped, we know when you purchased, we know what you bought and how much you bought and what you spent and if you used a code and you know what I mean? So we can really use that to our advantage for our, our customers so that we know, oh, hey, this this is a hot topic. This is not. We need to work on this. Um, and a lot of times I'll hear like, oh, I don't think this brand launch is going very well. We're not uh, we're not selling what we thought we would sell. And it's like, but don't worry. Right. I, I think that's like everybody wants that instant gratification. And a lot of times you have to just calm, you know, take a deep breath, the woo saw. Mm -hmm. Right. Take that moment and and give it a give it a day, give two days, give it a week, give it a month. And then you start looking at that data and you realize, oh, wow, OK, maybe it's not as, as bad as we all thought. Um, a lot of the launches that we've done, uh, like one of our, our bigger ones that, that we just helped with is Orabella uh, perfume line. And um, it it knocked everybody. Nobody thought it was going to do as well as it did. So it was like a, a nice surprise. Um, so. We were very, very excited to see everything go as well as it did. Um, but I just want to encourage folks, when you do these brand launches, make sure you're tying in. Because if you look at the Orbella site, you'll look at their socials, you'll look at their emails. Everything is consistent. The branding message does not differ. And I think sometimes what can happen is people get nervous because it's a big deal. You've got a lot of money on the table. There's timelines. There's things that aren't going wrong. Well, we'll just quickly do this. Don't quickly do anything. If I can give any advice when you're doing a brand launch, don't quickly do anything because it will bite you in, in the behind in the end. Take the time to make sure that your um, branding is consistent across all your service channels. That would be my, my big two cents there. Great stuff, Sherry. You're the best. I had a follow-up, a couple follow-up questions for you. Let's see what I can get through though. Um, when you are going through that, like what you're the examples you're giving, how long until you're making significant updates to that launch campaign? Is it, I know you mentioned like a couple days, give it a week, but is it like 30 days and then you're trying to make adjustments across channels or adjustments to the overall message? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And it depends on the service, right? If it's something like paid ads, that might be a little quicker, right? Like on spend or something yeah. like that. If it's email, I would, I tend to err on more of the longer term, right? Um, I have a client that was asking, we had launched uh, a Just Uno A-B test and it was uh, only about a week in and they're like, can we have a report? I'm like, we're going to want a little more um, than, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to want about a month, maybe two months on this one to get a full test because we want that statistical significance, right? You so. It really depends on what it is that you're you're wanting to to see because you want to make sure you have enough data to give you relevant data back. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that's great. And I feel like that kind of goes along with maybe how people behave on those channels anyway. Like you mentioned paid, that's probably a quick visit. Someone that might bounce fast probably doesn't know a whole lot about you. So that means responding quickly and matching up, syncing up with them. It's great. Is there... um you mentioned too, like the data from the launch. And I know you touched on like email data, SMS data, like, is there any unique metric or like point that you look at at a campaign and you're like, okay, this is going in the right direction that you would advise others to look at? For email or? Just in general, if it's like a brand launch, a product launch, yeah. So I, I, can, I can't really speak specifically to each channel because I'm not an expert in all, yeah. but- I would say for, for life cycle, the unique metrics that you want to look at, we all know open rates used to be the tried and true, but thank you freaking Apple mail for making our lives just a little more difficult. Right. So we can't really look at that. Um, so we've pivoted over time with the release of that to looking at our click data, where are people clicking um, and where are they more importantly clicking on the site and then looking at that site data, how long are they hanging out on the site before they convert? Are they converting at all, right? Like when you look at those metrics, you kind of get a better idea of what, what people's shopping habits are. Are they converting? Are they not converting? Um, how's the site speed? Um, is the product sold out? Like you can start getting a better picture of the hotspots on the site that are starting from the email. Awesome. Okay. So you're looking at like those windows between different actions and yes. what, what it's taken to get to the next. I love that feedback, Sherry. Thank you for letting me piggyback off a couple of things you said. I would love to transition to Aaron. What are your thoughts on this with Triple Whale and all that data in mind? I mean, I feel like y'all just hit it. Like that was <laughs> everything that anyone could need to know about a launch. If you've never done a launch before, or if you've been struggling for a launch, I think that there's a few things that really resonate that I would definitely echo as well too. The messaging portion of it, like having the same messaging across channels is so absolutely important to not confuse your customer base. I think also what's really important, something that Sherry also raised and so did Michael as well too, is brand awareness at each stage of the launch. We're talking the pre-launch, we're talking the launch itself, and then we're also talking about the post-launch. So the activity that surround each of those stages, but then also the data that's going to back each of those areas as well, too. There is a shit ton, sorry, my language. There's a lot of metrics that you could be reviewing during all of those stages. Um, really kind of like the top five, I feel that would just help you kind of get a really good, you know, simple understanding, a good grasp if things are actually working successfully at each stage. One of those, of course, being your sales revenue. So obviously this is going to be the most direct indicator of a launch success, really kind of analyzing the initial sales figures and the revenue to assess that immediate impact of the product on that market. Um, also your customer acquisition costs. So really being able to calculate the cost to acquire a new customers during that launch. Um, this will also help in understanding the efficiency of your marketing efforts and also your budget allocation. Um, same thing with your conversion rates. So being able to measure the percentage of visitors to your website or your landing page who actually made a purchase. So this metric can also help evaluate the effectiveness of your sales funnel and also your marketing messaging. Um, a big one that everyone was always looking at is your return on advertising spend. Yeah. So really being able to assess the profitability of your advertising campaigns, and then also being able to compare the revenue generated from those ads and the cost of those ads. And then the big one, which, you know, we should always be looking at and is also the product reviews and feedback. So really being able to collect and analyze the customer reviews and feedback. So getting those positive reviews that can also boost 
you know, the confidence in your product, but also remembering that the negative feedback can also provide opportunities for improvement. Um, and so those are kind of like just some of those like main metrics that you probably want, would like to just be able to review during each stage of the sales, I'm sorry, of the launch cycle as well too. Um, and just a, you know, a couple additional tips, which I feel would also really help. So with, when it comes to the pre-launch, just remember, you know, you're also a customer, everyone loves a good teaser. So, you know, being able to have a teaser or, you know, even something like an exciting countdown to heighten the anticipation for what is to come, um, can really just kind of help get people wanting to understand like, what is the next thing that's coming? So like being able to tease them with an image or like showing them a new product that shows like coming soon message can just really spark that excitement with your fans. Um, when it also comes to the launch itself, one thing that I've also just really loved and I mean, it's definitely caught my attention and made me believe in more in the value of the brand um, is getting influencers to whitelist your ads, which means running paid ads for the brand using a creator's account instead of using your brand's own accounts. And so when you whitelist, I also found for some reason, Facebook shows your ads way more often. So they actually might show up multiple times from different pages during one session. And this gives the prospects the feeling that they're seeing it everywhere and everyone is loving your product. And then as been mentioned, like for the post-launch phase, I just think it's really critical to continue and maintain that momentum from the launch. So if someone attends your launch but didn't make a purchase, they likely have objections that need to be addressed. Similar to those who did buy, it's also important to nurture them, to, to be nurturing them, um, to also return as a customer. So really retargeting those customers after that product launch is key to sustaining engagement and also boosting conversions. Um, so you could either do that through email, you know, being able to do target messaging, to, you know, and segmenting those customers who didn't purchase versus who did. Um, also engagement on social media. So anyone that is responding versus, you know, if they want to have more questions about your products or they just have, you know, amazing comments from loving the products that they just purchased, just ensuring that you are responding to those comments, you're sharing relevant con uh, content as well as continuing to create interactive posts that can just attract customers to come back to your site. Um, and then the big one that I just constantly love and love to spread it just those customer feedback surveys you know sending out surveys to understand the customer experience of why they were you know an interesting visitor who didn't purchase or why they did come and did purchase and using this feedback to improve your product of marketing strategy and to keep these customers engaged for follow-up communications beautiful wrap-up Erin you touch I love that you touched on like feedback and like even oh, if we're in that feedback state, I love feedback yeah, me too yeah <laughs> I'm like, I just want feedback everywhere, every time, all the time. Yeah. Um, but when it's at awareness stage, like you're so caught up in just like making sure the message is right, but that's still the best time to get feedback, like that you can pivot and make adjustments to later on in the campaign. So it's like the full benefit. Um, your campaign gets the full benefit of your learnings if you are proactively trying to do those things. I like your point too. Like you, you can do that post-purchase. You can do it on site. You can do it in email. Like doing it in all those places is not too much because probably the first two, like they're not going to leave a review. They're not going to leave a message. So it's a mix of finding them at the right time, finding them on the right device and place, and then just like giving them the option to do that. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, gorgeous, I think, and you know, they definitely talk about this, like your customers communicate you with you from all different channels. So just because, you know, one customer is buying from your website, maybe the other customer is buying from your Instagram shop. So it's super important just to keep that, you know, consistent conversation happening throughout all channels. Absolutely. You made me think of, I don't know who else may know about free people, but oh, so like love. Yeah. They sell all those like yeah. workout things and definitely up there in pricing. So can probably see how maybe they have some pricing stuff going on. It just has an objection, but I threw it in chat. I threw one of their links in chat because they have a great like maternity line. And one of the things they do in Austin and other cities too, is they'll have some sort of like activity that's really movement focused around that specific group and based on geo-targeting, where their shoppers at, where they have a lot of voices talking about them. So I know they're probably a bigger brand, but something you as a brand can still do because one, you have the data, 
if you're using something like just, you know, or I'm sure one of our other tools on here um, or working one-on-one -on -one with Sherry, you can find out where most of your orders are coming from, wherever they are in the world, hone in on those segments and allow that to help you either get awareness out with other people sharing for you and then building a community that you can still build off of for following launches. Great example. I obviously, I can't go to that event of theirs, but I am looking for one that I can go to. <laughs> Cool. So I didn't see any questions pop in. We'll hop into the next theme here. I've got some examples for you. Again, these will be in the deck, but this is just some examples of omni-channel targeting with lead capture in mind, because I know that's a huge focus should kind of be step one on a website, right? Gathering their email or SMS. Um, and we're showing different things like to all visitors, depending on where they're coming from, return visitors, they didn't opt in, can also mix this based off of if they're coming from a certain part of the U.S., maybe an area where like your podcast is hosted, different ways that you can do geolocation targeting here. And then on the right-hand side, this is a great call out to something I mentioned earlier of partnering with other brands. So they partnered with another brand. I think there was a link or something on that brand site that then led back to this Happy V site, which is a women's health company. And they're already addressing this new visitor as, as, the, um, as the audience of the other brand. So we're not trying to like immediately sell our brand here. We're one, just recognizing and then trying to guide them through. So a couple examples there, a couple examples from Happy V continued. On the right-hand side, this was for their awareness campaign around a new product launch where they really had to dive into education. So you can mix this kind of educational pop-up messaging um, with your lead capture. This can be like the follow-up screen they see, or this could be something you actually just embed on your site somewhere. Maybe it's on the product page and you only show it to paid traffic, or you only show it to return customers. Someone that's gonna show a little bit more intent to engage with that and give you some really good data. So lots you can do, totally depends on the brand and kind of what, what the overall goal is there. So we'll get into theme two now. So we're talking about pricing. I saw a lot of comments come in from registrants about price friction and like, we don't want to discount. We just want to be able to like <laughs> sell ourselves in like a good way. And I totally get that. I mean, I'm not like give everyone a discount. I love it. We don't have to have that be our first approach. Like there's so many other mm -hmm. things we can do before we get there. And mm -hmm. on the previous topic, like if you're doing a, a launch, I would totally avoid that inclusion of an offer of some sort. Sherry, I'm not sure where you've stood with that before, but maybe just leaving that, you know, for after and seeing how just the overall campaign does for itself and kind of speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So transitioning now, how do you approach price friction with value propositions that are aimed at justifying that price point? And bonus, if you can share examples of value propositions that were effective that stood out to you or just super creative. Let's start with Sherry. This, and I'm going to just toot just do knows like loudly. Because <laughs> this is one of my favorite features that you guys have with your pop-ups and banners and all fun things is the ability to specifically target from wherever the person is coming in and then being able to message accordingly from the ESP, right? Like, so from a Clavio or whatever, right? So I get this a lot because, uh, you know, discounts are a thing, right? I don't want to cheapen my brand. I don't want to, you know, eat into my margins. Well, the fantastic thing is you don't have to, right? You can absolutely tear things out. Not everybody has to get the same discount. And I think initially when folks think about it, they just go, oh, 10%. Let's give everybody 10 or 20% off. But you don't need to do that. Like, the fun part about life cycle for me is being able to see that purchase history I was, you know, referencing referencing earlier. So say you have your VIP segment. These folks don't need a deep discount. They're mm -hmm. already in. They're bought. They love you. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't need 20% off. Maybe throw them five or maybe say, hey, you get early access to a sale before the rest, right? And that sale discount is less than what you're going to launch three hours later, right? It, it doesn't matter. So like, you can take that as a, a, a as a way to message folks. You can then say maybe, hey, I want to give my SMS VIP customers um, early access discount, whatever, right? You can tier things out. I think 
one thing I talk a lot to clients about is tiering discounts based on the engagement. So somebody that's not as engaged, right, which is a segment that I think oftentimes gets um, forgotten, right? They, oh, they're not engaged. Then what do we do? I guess, I guess we'll just, we'll try to, you know, re-engagement series and then that's it. Well, that doesn't have to be it, right? Beyond that re-engagement series that we do with Lifecycle or SMS that, yes, would have some type of an offer or something to motivate, don't forget your social channels. Export that list. Get it out to your socials. See if you can get them back in the fold with, you know, some different messaging. Um, your welcome series. So going back to Just Uno and tooting their horn, like, say I want to have my social folks get a specific discount as a new customer. I want my paid to get a specific discount as a new customer. And I want my organic to get a specific discount for a new customer. You can do that using Just Uno and then, you know, tailoring that welcome series to then match that messaging, right? And then after that, based on purchase or non-purchase history, you then continue that, you know, tree root of segmentation in your ESP or CRM to then nurture, right? Okay. Are we going to get them to purchase again? Are we going to throw them in a loyalty program? Um, are we going to uh, start a bucket of people who purchase over a certain price point? And that's another thing with discounting. It doesn't have to be all in at the same time. It could be a flash sale. It could be um, uh, and I know this is, I'm going to date myself here, but back in the day, um, <laughs> like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you used to have to go to the mall. And when you would go to the mall, there was a store, well, Macy's, everybody knows Macy's, right? But Macy's would have different offers based on the hour of the day. So if you got there early, you got the deeper discounts than if you got there later, right? So if you got in line at 6 a.m. with your Starbucks to get your, I don't know, pillows and comforters, you got 50% off. But the people that slept in had breakfast and then got there at nine, they only got 35% off, right? So it's it's kind of using that same mentality um, based on interest level and things like that. Don't be afraid to, to change your discount to actually fit the segment that you're targeting. I think that would be my my big thing on fear of, you know, price friction and discounting your brand. Yeah. When I hear you say that immediately, I'm like, okay, that's a lot to track if I'm going to try to be doing different offers, right? Is that just like a simple spreadsheet that you're using to monitor and kind of see what's being used and the rate of that being used at all? Um, no, it's actually all captured in your wonderful reporting as well as your ESP. So when when you have like say a welcome series set up, you can individualize those metrics and like Clavio, for example, you can see how that welcome series is performing and who's converting. And then at the end of the month, right, compare, you know, yeah. extrapolate all that data and say, okay, how'd we do? You know, and I encourage you guys. Do stuff like this now because this type of data is great for Q4. I'm just going to throw that out because it's never Had too to. early to about Q4. <laughs> no, not at all. That's great. So you you rely on the metrics and the platforms and then help that use that to build like an overall story instead of yep. trying to track individually, which is true. Yeah. Within an individual pop-up or message, you can see all the metrics of not just like who is redeeming, like newer return visitor, but where they're redeeming that, like where are they engaging on site? What exact page? So similar to if we're thinking about like, what are your high converting pages? Like what are your high engagement pages where something you're doing on that is really working? Awesome, Sherry. I had a follow-up question for you on prices because I don't know if you've seen or seen your clients, like sometimes if they're on Instagram selling, they'll have like a 20% off, like 30% off that maybe Instagram is giving. But when they get on site, that discount is unapplied, maybe it's 10%. Like, do you have any any feedback on that or experience in like dealing with those two types of platforms giving offers? I haven't because I don't manage the socials, but I have heard the social team bring it up on calls historically. Okay. You know, yeah. and they're like, wait a minute, why uh, they went to the site, we're getting some feedback, right? So it's it's kind of, again, I think strategic in how you market the message. Maybe it is 20% off, but maybe it's only certain products. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the site is the, is a different discount, but it's for everything, right? So you can kind of, you can kind of play with it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all about like, as you play with it, like be super transparent. If like oh, yeah. break it down, you know, as if they've never seen a website before, 
And yeah. that's where like, maybe if they are coming from Instagram and they've seen that offer a simple banner, that's like, that's what this offers for here. You're getting this just yeah. some really good clarity on like what, what they can expect. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. I appreciate that feedback on social. Let's take it over to Aaron. What are you thinking from Triple Whale side on this or what have you seen? So <laughs> it's actually funny because earlier this year, um, our Triple Whale experts actually predicted that brands would face challenges selling products at full price year round. And this was actually driven by customers' expectations for sales events. So nailing the right price point becomes critical, especially in these uncertain economic times when consumer spending tends to be a little bit more cautious. So I'm going to take a different spin with this one. Um, so I definitely 100% agree with everything that Sherry said when it comes to the tiering system um, and you know creating appropriate discounting um, and those price points for specific segmentations. The way that I'm am going to kind of approach this one is, and to address this challenge, is recommending proactively advertising to customers ahead of sales and really emphasizing the value proposition of the products through educational content and exclusive offers. And one great way of doing this, another like shameless plug for Just Uno, is doing those like education pop-ups, for instance. And what helps with this is that this approach really helps brands establish a strong foundation of perceived value, which is also known as that value-based pricing to minimize price friction across every channel. So the example that I'm going to use for this is a brand that I feel does a really good job at value-based value, uh, value -based pricing is actually Sheertex. So rather than them focusing solely basing their pricing on cost or on what their competition is selling their products for, they determine their product's worth in the eyes of the, of the customer. So Sheertex offers really high quality, unrippable tights, and honestly, at a very premium price. So despite that their tights costing nearly double the average pair of tights, they've become a top selling brand in the US. Now you're probably all wondering, how do these really expensive tights become number one? Well, it's because they understand their, their target customer's value proposition. So sheer techs recognize that the importance that their customers placed on durability and that value that traditional tights often really lack. So most tights being able to rip with only a couple of hours of wearing them. I'm sure all the ladies here have had that frustration wearing them out for a couple hours. And as you're about to enter the meeting, there goes that rip. So by offering a product that is that lasts approximately 10 times longer than the traditional alternative, sure techs can actually justify that higher price point while also satisfying their customer base. So in other words, don't always sell your products as a physical item with a cost, but as a solution with those tangible benefits. And then when it actually comes to being able to um, help customers in that omni-channel experience, and being able to effectively show value proposition, overcome those price concerns. Um, there are a few different strategies you can do here as well too. So for instance, like in store. So really the strategy here is to use physical stores to provide that tactical experience where customers can actually see and touch and try the product. And honestly, you don't even need to have your own store. You can also see about doing a special promo with a store that has like the same look and feel as your brand or even consider doing like a pop-up location. And in any of these scenarios, staff should just be really well-trained on how to explain the unique features and benefits that justify the product's price. Um, another great one for an online example is like utilizing influencers on TikTok. So really leveraging social proof and influencer endorsements. So the strategy here is to collaborate with influencers who can de demonstrate the product's value in real life scenarios. So influencers should not only just discuss the product, but also the lifestyle and the problem solving aspect that it also supports. And then Lastly, um, another one for an online presence would be like shopping on Instagram. So the strategy here is just utilizing, you know, shopping experiences like Instagram shopping features to make the transition from viewing 
to purchasing as smooth as possible. So for an online consumer, and I'm sure everyone here can agree, it's not just about the value of the product that they're buying, but it's also about the buying journey. So really posting high quality images and videos that showcase the product in use, along with that detailed description and direct links to that purchasing page and just making a really smooth transition into actually doing that final purchase is gonna be super important. And then just like a little insider tip, offering those exclusive Instagram promotions or limited time deals. So this is kind of where that you can now kind of offer like a bit of a discount because they are engaging with that online uh, presence for you to really kind of do that limited deal or even create a sense of urgency so that they do buy at that time. And then just once again, emphasize the convenience of shopping directly through Instagram that added value for ease of access and reviews. So I feel all of these strategies can just really help you not having to do such deep discounting. And like I said, just really kind of educating the customers on the value of the product and helping them to understand why they're actually buying the solution and not necessarily the physical product. I love that, Erin. You hit like what I took from that is a lot of like, there should be a good focus on demonstrating. And ideally that is translating to kind of that tangible use right, that you're talking mm -hmm. about. I love that. I think it can get kind of tricky when you're dealing with creatives or influencers because it is like you're kind of giving them a little bit of free reign to address their audience, but that is what works. So giving those creators, whoever you're working with, just a guideline and ensuring that they are trained up, you know, enough to speak to your product will go a long way just naturally. They will be prepared. And it's all about preparing future you, your future site for success. I love that. You made me think of a buying journey that didn't make me mad, but I was like, dude, come on. But I was on a site and they were promoting that they had Apple Pay. I don't know where I saw it on the homepage or somewhere and like with their other payments. And that will get me to like shop instantly. Like I will pretty much buy. I get to check out and I'm just waiting for Apple Pay to come up, you know, like, okay, is it here? And I ended up like going pages back, trying to figure out where Apple Pay was. Turns out they actually did not have it in the checkout area, but it was being promoted earlier on. So although I love that they were trying to highlight an easy way to convert, an easy way to shop and kind of getting through that, this is associated with price friction, but like the actual giving the money part, um, it's nice to of course, execute at the end, but just keep those reminders up of different kinds of payment options that address that, I guess, bigger picture view of like giving the money to you. But it's so true because honestly, like, like I said, it's, it all comes down to the value. It's all becomes down to what we perceive this item to cost. And it's so much of the product itself, but it's also so much of that journey. And even that moment of friction, like that small moment that you had to have to type in your credit card versus using yeah. Apple Pay, all of a sudden, even subconsciously, you de started devaluing going back and purchasing from this brand. Like, it's just so crazy, like how that just happens all of a sudden. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm like kind of stuck in it because I need the product, right? I have a <laughs> project I need to do. It has to happen. So like, yeah. I'm just already dreading going back and having to do that whole thing again. I'm sure there was an option to save my card info, but I never do that. I never want to do that. No. So yeah, just to note that these little things can influence many, many interactions later on. Enough of us though, Michael, I would love to hear from you on price friction. Well, I, I think Sherry, Aaron, Steph, you guys all covered some really, really good points. And I'm just trying to think of any... Anything outside of what, what you guys already kind of mentioned, there are only like a couple of like really kind of minor things here, maybe um, one on like the pricing friction side. And I think Aaron did a really good job of explaining like how the value of the product and how it's positioned and how it's priced really helps to drive home that alignment um, to kind of build off of that. One of the other things is also like taking those products, bundling them together. So like instead of offering like a discount on maybe an individual set of tights, maybe like a three pack, right? Something where you can get a complimentary item together. You know, maybe there's a slightly discounted price, but what that does is that encourages like a larger average order value while maintaining that perceived value of those individual products. So you're not necessarily like reducing that, you know, regular price. You're just kind of giving a bit of like a unit volume uh, discount depending on what it is. And that may not work for every single type of product and every 
every single type of brand. But I think just kind of thinking about where those things might fit uh, with your business uh, is, is kind of building off of that. Another area where you're not necessarily going to be like adding friction to that pricing perspective is uh, using like loyalty programs, right? Loyalty programs where customers earn points for things uh, and they get rewarded for those purchases. So there's a couple of things in incentivizes repeat purchases, which is great for customer lifetime value. Um, and it doesn't necessarily like resort to discounts while still adding value. Right. Um, I know that I'm a, I'm a victim of this myself, like with tons of things, like, uh, a great example, I think, is uh, like, don't hate me for this, but like, I don't know why I like Subway sandwiches, but I do. And, <laughs> you know, like they always have some kind of promo going yeah. on. I know it's terrible, but, you know, like you you like earn rewards and stuff over time. And, you know, that's more of like a CPG product. But um, I think it's still really is is very well documented. I mean, uh, leaving a review for a product. I know that's something we we talked about earlier. Um, th those can all be things that kind of tie into your greater like product awareness strategy and pricing friction, right? The more people you have talking about your product, you can then use that to generate content, right? And then that content builds trust because it's from another consumer, right? And it's all kind of layered like throughout the process. Um, there's ways to kind of like automate that, you know, automate certain aspects of it. If somebody doesn't leave a great review, you can automatically capture that like maybe it's like three stars you can automatically reach out to that person or create like a ticket in your support team where say hey what was what was the issue with that product maybe it just got damaged on the way that's a great opportunity to like resend them another one give them a great customer experience so that they'll keep coming back to you and have less of a question of like was that worth it because their customer experience actually kind of is tied into that value of the product right it's not just what you buy it's like the whole buying experience. And then I guess um, kind of lastly, I know, uh, Steph, you covered like that, that free shipping threshold uh, graphic before. That's a great way to kind of like, you know, have people add a couple extra things to their cart to qualify for that. Or um, kind of as Sherry mentioned, like, who are you going to serve that discount to? Maybe you'll serve that free shipping discount to that new customer, because now this is like a customer acquisition cost question. So is me giving this free shipping in order to gain this customer worthwhile? You know, you can always try that. And I guess lastly, um, those limited time offers like create some urgency around around that. And uh, they don't always have to align to like every single holiday. Um, they could be a little more randomized, but you can give those like exclusive deals to people who are subscribing to your you know email list and and you know giving some time limitations on that really helps like drive that purchase a little bit sooner rather than later if you are looking for those like levers to pull when it comes to that and again without like diluting your brand's pricing so those are the only other things i can think of that hadn't already uh, been discussed there perfect additions michael i i love what you were saying it made me think like ultimately we're removing friction by adding in a lot of points of micro engagements so just little things that are getting people to the next spot, just the next good thought about you. Cool. So I know we got five minutes, everyone. I have at least one more theme I would like to get to if possible. Panelists, are you able to hang on for another 10, 15? How are we looking? It looks like we also have a question from Connor too. Yes. That I think would be interesting. I think Sherry would also probably have some good points here. Okay, I yeah, let's get to that one. For sure. Let me throw it in there. We'll do like another 10, 15, see if we can get to this one to get some good value. But if you have to hop panelists, I appreciate you hanging on here. Um, but yes, we have a question in the chat that we'll all just speak out right now. So do we have any advice for retargeting with restricted products such as collectible wine, alcohol, Facebook ads, and Google prohibit personalized targeting for this category, making it difficult to build out a funnel with multiple touch points. Totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and this makes it difficult for cross-channel, aka omni-channel marketing as well. So Connor, first, I have a webinar later this month that is exactly on high-risk products oh. and brands. So I'll throw that link in the chat for later. But Sherry, yes, I would love to hear your feedback on this. Shaft. I <laughs> <laughs> God, even the acronym for it just makes you angry. Um, so from the life cycle perspective, SMS 
for like things like um, uh, CBD brands or alcohol brands, just you can get away with it maybe for a hot minute, but they're going to eventually find out. So you kind of have to like chop that one off eventually. Email, you can get around a little bit easier. And those are the only two I'm really going to speak to because I can't really speak to the other service channels. But um, uh, email, you can get a little more customizable. Like, for example, if you're saying you have um, restricted products such as collectible wine. So based on their shopping history, you obviously can create different segmented email campaigns targeting them, right? Maybe you have a new release, a limited release. You can do things like that via email. I know it kind of sucks because you can't mirror that. Um, with SMS, but different loyalty programs, you might be able to do like point systems. I've seen a lot of that with the point mm -hmm. systems be very successful. I myself might be in a few wine clubs. Um, <laughs> just, um, so I would, I would lean more towards that than the obvious, like, yes, we segment our emails exactly. Oh, perfect. Yes. That's, that's going to be the, the, the biggest, fastest touch point you can get without breaking any of the shaft regulations, because you do have to be careful of that. And I also want to be cognizant of time, but I have a feeling Aaron might have a few more tips and tricks on this one. I mean, the one thing, like, I'm, I'm, I don't know this for certain, like, I actually, I, now I want to like jump in and do my research, but I'm wondering if like other platforms like TikTok and Pinterest have more flexibility when it comes to uh, that type of marketing and personalizing. And with TikTok shop now just exploding, I if it does have more of that flexibility, I definitely would utilize it. Also going back to kind of like working with influencers, like doing that whitelisting, like having them kind of really go to their audiences and spread the word about your brands and getting that content out there, I think would be really helpful. Another thing too, and Sherry brought this up when it comes to like loyalty programs, when it comes to our data, it is actually insane how many times when we go through our pixel that, you know, a sale is, is attributed to Google. But when we actually look at it, when we get more granular, it's not Google that got that sale. It's actually a, a referral from a friend. And so you would be surprised how much Google is not actually helping you out when you actually really look at the data. And it's really just the referrals from your amazing loyal customers that you're already working with. So I think Sherry was really correct by saying, you know, really kind of pushing those loyalty programs, getting the word out, having more word of mouth as well, too, and not really relying so heavily on the legacies like your Googles and your Facebooks, because a lot of times, like, it's not really where a lot of these purchases are even coming from um but and then also you know looking at these other platforms out there that i think might have more of that flexibility for you great great wrap up on that one guys i i hope this is what i'm gonna say is like okay <laughs> but i have worked with brands that in this space they're creating multiple sites for different goals so one site is more of that educational mm. content it's more of the kind of like what we've been saying about the value and addressing price friction. And it's really focused on that and has great content, maybe not like a whole full site with a cart, right? But that site is then linking to where they actually are selling the products. So if you're doing that, what we've been able to accomplish is you get that personalized targeting in just, you know, because both of the sites are being managed in the same account. So they're speaking to each other and you can target specifically if they've landed on that more educational site versus if they're coming for some reason to your shop site. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more work for sure. But when it comes to like this category specifically, like your site to me is the source of truth. It should be where everything is, is kind of referenced back to. So mm -hmm. I hope that helps Connor. I appreciate the question so much. Thank you, sir. Michael, did you want to add anything onto that? I know we kind of rounded out that one. Anything no, it's all good. It just, uh, you know, in the interest of time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome, guys. So let's see. Let's wrap up this third theme on retention. So we're thinking of top strategy to retain interest across offline to online. And how does that interest created lead to an actual action? Like subscribing to a product or an email or SMS, right? opening something, checking out an influencer or someone on Crete on social, um, or kind of like Aaron was saying, actually getting that word of mouth 
which you can't really track, I know, but just from what you can best know about your audience. Surveys, you can do surveys. There you go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> we'll Survey there. Fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Aaron, you can kick us off on that one then. Uh, sure. Okay. So um, I, I mean, Sherry has mentioned this a few times. I think number one, to seamlessly transition from like offline to online. Um, it's just so critical to maintain consistent branding and messaging across all platforms. And I mean, I truly believe this because with the average human attention span at like just eight seconds, any inconsistency can lead to a customer to completely disengage. So you just really wanna make sure everything is super consistent. And then beyond ensuring that consistent, that consistent messaging, um, I also think that another great way to engage offline customers online is to incorporate technologies like QR codes in physical locations that can really kind of bridge that gap. So these codes can seamlessly connect customers to online content, enabling them to do immediate actions such as like subscribing or following influencers or even actually like accessing new product features, tips and savings. I know like massive brands like L'Oreal and Dove have also experienced significant successes with QR codes. Um, I saw somewhere that L'Oreal saw like a remarkable like 70% increase in conversion rates just implementing a QR code. And if you think about a product like, like L'Oreal, they were not, you know, part of the e-commerce boom. They became a part of it because they had to, but they were known to be more of an in-store product. So it's, you know, interesting to know that they have even saw a huge increase by having these type of in um, QR codes. And then additionally, which one thing I do really love, and I've talked about this before, is adopting, um, they're called digital marketing um, marketing uh, experiences. So that's blending physical and digital experiences. And this will also help kind of like bridge that gap between offline and online. So for instance, like a good digital uh, strategy could be offering in-store education and then guiding that customer to online resources. And then once they're online, you can encourage the customers to engage with your brand on social media, um, which will also ultimately help you to build that stronger loyalty and interaction. And then after generating that online interest, you can ignite excitement amongst those prospects or customers by offering those like exclusive online content or even special incentives. Um, and this can also include discounts or early product access reserved only for those email subscribers or social media followers. So those perks just providing and encouraging those offline customers to continue being those like actively and, and to be actively engaging with your brand online. And just like really quickly, I know we have too much time. There is a brand that I just really love their digital strategy. And that was actually the one I talked about earlier today, like, which was the detox market. So the reason why I think that they really excel bridging the gap between offline and online is just prioritizing convenience and incentives. So not only do they offer online purchases with in-store pickup, but they also run this bottle returns program for rewards. So this incentive not only supports customers in reducing their carbon footprint, but it also offers additional like um, incentives by allowing loyalty, um, by allowing loyal customers to also earn points for future purchases. So personally, I've actually found myself coming back for more thanks to the rewards earned from returning my empty bottles. And I feel that these are the type of strategies that really kind of are becoming vital to remaining relevant in today's dynamic retail environment. Absolutely. That's such a great point. I like that example of like, that's exactly what's driving you back into store. Maybe not the product, but that experience that you get to have and contribute to. That's yeah, amazing. So, and there's yeah. a lot happening with like, you know, the younger generations coming up and getting their buying power. Like they have influence over their parents and how their parents mm -hmm. are shopping. Like I know I'm always on my parents like, hey, you should be doing this. And this is what we do now, you know, in shopping. And this is how you should browse. <laughs> so it's like there's an element of generational education, too, that's happening and like things that are important or should that should be important to the masses. So great points there, Aaron. Thank you so much. Let's take it over to Gorgeous. Michael, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so th I, this is a really fun question and it's kind of like, my my inner hype beast is coming out i'm a bit you know into like those streetwear brands and uh I, I think one of the kind of offline to online strategies is like the concept of like exclusive items so um 
one of the brands that comes to mind for this is uh, Stussy.com. They're like a streetwear brand based out of LA with stores like all over and a huge online presence. Um, on a recent trip, I went to Hawaii a few weeks ago and they have a, a location there. I thought, hey, you know, they have a store. I'll go check it out. And I was actually really, really shocked because the store opens, I think, at like 10 a.m. And I'm, you know, going from California to Hawaii, I'm up super early. So I'm up early, just getting some coffee, walking around. And I see like a ton of people waiting in line in front of the store. And it's like hours before opening. Right. And I think that's a really, really good example of like, why are these people here? Um, is it was because there's exclusive items. And this is like every single day that it's like this. Um, and basically what they do is they have an exclusive tea, like Stussy Honolulu, and people really, really want that. So once it's gone, it's gone for the day. And, um, you know, that's a really great example of like taking people's online ideas of the brand and then putting that to an offline, kind of like the reverse flow there. But I think there's like tons of opportunities because now people are aware about this. They go online to check, maybe they can find the item, but, you know, having, you know, what was mentioned earlier, like QR codes, social media handles, any in-store signage, stuff like that, packaging that encourages people to follow you online um, and helps like promote like offline events, special offers through email newsletters, uh, social posts, like that all drives like that offline engagement. And that cross promotion really encourages that the customers to like take action in both areas. There's one other example that I have that's really, really interesting. Um, you know, it's it's also kind of a uh, timely given uh, the what is it the great beef of 2024 with a couple of rappers Drake. And, oh, uh, yeah. oh my god! But, like I had, had to get Chat GBT to tell me what was going on. I'm like, just yeah. summarize. This I know. Summary. I know. <laughs> there's there's definitely a lot. The focus is not so much on on that, but I just thought it was funny because I have this great example of like. It's called Drake related and it doesn't matter like what side of the beef you're on. I think it's just interesting to look at. It's basically like a virtual shopping where uh, it gives you like an example of like this room, which emulates a physical presence. You hover over items and then it takes you to like online shops, kind of like a curated collection. And I think it's a really, really interesting approach that um, brands today and, and I'm sure the ones that are featured here are getting like huge lift from this, but it's so interesting that it's the concept of like an offline experience being just like re-emulated online. So if that looks kind of interesting, just to check out, um, I'm in no way affiliated with this. It's just like things I see and and think are interesting, like they're happening like in the e-commerce space today. So just pop that in there. If you guys want to see the room. and uh, Oh, that's cool. That's really cool, Michael. Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. I love it. I know we had some people drop off, so I'll include it in the recap email just as like resources we can share. Beautiful. Let's take it over to Sherry. Can you wrap us up on this one? I will. I'll wrap us up super quick. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. I'm just, I'm gonna, since I'm the old one, I'm going to go back to like the first time I saw like the, the power of social media. It's, I was living in um, Silver Lake at the time and I was down in the Fairfax district and I saw this humongous line and I was like, what the heck? And it looked like it was going to like of just like an empty store, right? It turns out it was um, for the sneakerheads, and it was a store called Soul Revival. And they were in line to get a specific VIP launch. So of course I go up and ask being a marketing person. I'm like, what are you guys doing in line here? So this is, this is the skivvy. This is what I found out. They were given um, access via SMS and email with a specific code word that they had to say at the door. And, and they were unique code words. Like I said, well, what's your code word? And what's your, they were different. I'm like, wow, they went all out on this. I guess it was some super expensive limited release sneaker that everybody just had to have. Anyway, um, they were given this code and word to say. And then when they went in, they had to scan a QR code to enter, right? So they get in, they can make their purchase. They get all the, the cool, you know, insight, in-store awesomeness that, that came from online. But they took it a step further because they were given a special online code that was only available for a limited time. And that push was if they made a purchase, they got they would then get info to deeper discounts after. So it was like they they kept it online. So they kept it in store and online and then in store again and then online again. I was just like, whoever developed this was a genius. This was beautiful. Yeah. Like, like 
<laughs> it was the perfect, like all encompassing thing. Cause you got the email, the QR code, the SMS, the in-store back to on-site, back to in-store. It was, it was pretty impressive. So um, I was, I was like, okay, wow. Power of marketing at its finest for the sneaker launch. It was very, they also do that to combat resellers, which is another yeah. huge ah. issue that can sometimes happen with these really popular items. And as a brand, sometimes they expect you to have some level of control of that or to prevent people from like gaming the system. Sure. Yeah, that's really interesting. Dang. So yeah, they're looking out for their interests, of course, but just tying in all of their channels together, which kind of does feel like you're going from back to back, right? But what that is all addressing is many journeys, many experiences that can take place. Like one person maybe is not experiencing everything. Very cool, Sherry. Thank you for that example. Excellent. So we are up on our time. I'm going to get through. We had a great final question, guys. We'll get to it next time. <laughs> but we have some special offers when you mention this webinar. I apologize. I wasn't able to add Sherry's and Michael's in here, but I will throw that into our um, recording email. So we've got a free website conversion audit, free founders dash from Aaron. I'll throw the link in chat here. And we have free audit from Sherry, just depending on what your focus is, and then a free CX audit from Gorgeous Team. Let me grab that. Why can't I find it? And just for everybody to know, with Founders Dash, so it is literally so much of what Trip Whale offers. So you'll get so much of the data that you're looking for. You're able to integrate with channels like your Google, Facebook, um, Klaviyo. And being able to capture all that data into a beautiful um, dashboard. And this is completely free forever. So it really kind of gives you a good idea of what it's like to leverage data for your store. Um, especially if you are in a little bit of a bud budget cr crunch right now and can't really add more to your tech stack. So this is just a really great way to kind of get started with that and, uh, and see what Triple has to offer. Excellent. Thank you for that, Aaron. You are the best. And I just finished throwing everyone's in chat for what you all want to go to. Fabulous. Thank you, speakers. I appreciate your time and for hanging on a little bit over with me. Um, I'll send out the recording email today. And please follow up with any questions, everyone. There's a small hand raiser at the end of this when you close out of the Zoom. So just be sure to notate anyone that you'd like to hear from. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, guys.